Good evening to everybody and thank you so much for that really warm welcome and thank you as well to the city of Munich and to the German Association of Publishers and to the jury for this really profound award which I am truly honored and humbled to receive. When I learned that I had been chosen for the award I was of course very happy and very gratified. I, I knew the story of Sophie and Hans Scholl and, and knew about the award to some extent, but I actually, my first thought was that I may not be able to travel to Germany on the date of the ceremony um, simply because of scheduling conflicts. And on the day that the award was announced, a German friend of mine called me very excited um, and he said, congratulations, I, I can't wait to go and see the event. And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually thinking about the possibility that I, I might not be able to attend. I, I really want to, but I just, I don't know if I can. And he was outraged, scandalized at even the mere possibility that I was thinking about not attending, and I said, I, I know it's a very prestigious award, um, and I would love to go, but it's, it's just a matter of time constraints. And he said, no, you don't understand. Um, it's not about the prestige of the award. There are a lot of prestigious awards all over the world, um, and you can't go and, and, and go to every ceremony. He said, it's not about that. He said, just spend an hour online reading about what this prize is about and what the spirit behind it is. And you will see that it is the perfect award for what you and Laura Poitras and Edward Snowden tried to do in the work that you did. And I spent 15 minutes reading about the history of the award and the story behind it and the purpose of why it's awarded. And I immediately knew that there was no choice at all, that it was <laughs> mandatory that I come. There, there has been a lot of attention paid to the disclosures of these documents, and, and rightfully so. We, we wanted the focus to be on the questions of surveillance and privacy in the internet age. But I actually think that there is at least as important a part of this story, if, if not a more important part of the story, and, and that is the human lesson that I think can be learned by looking at the events of the last 18 months. When, when I went to Hong Kong to meet Edward Snowden in June of, of last year, I had spent several weeks talking to him on the internet using encryption so that nobody could monitor what we were saying. And other than the fact that I knew he wanted to give me a huge number of documents that he said proved that the US government was illegally spying on the world. Other than that, I knew nothing about him. I, I did not know his name. I did not know where he worked. I did not know his gender or his age. And I traveled to Hong Kong with an expectation of who I was meeting that turned out to be completely wrong. I had this mental image of who he was and I had assumed that he must be fairly old. In part because I figured if somebody was willing to risk their whole life to expose this injustice, it must be because they have spent year after year after year after year witnessing it and just got to the point where they were no longer able to stand by and do nothing. 
I also knew that he was going to risk spending the rest of his life in prison. And I think without really consciously describing it to myself, I assumed that it's probably easier to spend the rest of your life in prison if you're 75 years old rather than 25. It just seemed natural to me. And so when I got to Hong Kong and I met Edward Snowden for the first time, I, I say this without any exaggeration, it was probably the most confusing and disorienting event in my entire life. There before me was not a hardened veteran of the American national security state, but a kid. I mean, he was 29 years old, but he looked at least five or six years younger. He was wearing a white t-shirt and jeans and was very thin. He hadn't left the hotel room for at least three weeks, so he was very pale. He looked like the average nerd that you see in a shopping mall or on a college campus. And when I sat down with him and started asking him about his life, it became even more amazing to me. It, it wasn't just that he was so young. It was that he was so ordinary. He was somebody who grew up basically poor. He, he had no power or prestige of any kind. He didn't come from a well-connected or wealthy family with influence, quite the opposite. He was completely ordinary in every way. He didn't even finish high school. And yet here was this person, completely ordinary in every way, prepared to do something so extraordinary. We in Hong Kong assumed, we were almost certain, that Edward Snowden's future was going to be sitting in a cage in an American prison by himself for the rest of his life. No prison is a good place to be, but an American prison when you are accused of endangering national security is one of the worst places to be. That was the assumption on which we were operating. Now that was extraordinary enough that he was willing to risk going to prison for the rest of his life at the age of 29. But what was even more amazing to me and this is something that influenced everything that I did in the work that I, I was able to do and will influence me for the rest of my life. There was never a single moment, not one moment, when Edward Snowden exhibited any slight fear or hesitation or remorse about what he had done even when we thought we were hours away from having people knock on the hotel room where we were working to take him away, even when the US government made him the number one fugitive of the world's most powerful government, they were so desperate to get him that they actually forced a plane carrying the president of Bolivia to land in Austria. That's how crazy the US government was to get him. Even when all of that was happening, there was never a moment where he thought to himself or showed, maybe I did something I shouldn't have done. And I spent four or five of the first days when I was in Hong Kong doing very little other than trying to understand what would cause somebody at the age of 29, with a seemingly happy and fulfilled life, he had a very good job, he, make, he was making a lot of money, he had a girlfriend who loved him and a family who supported him. He was willing, in fact, eager 
to throw all of that away simply in defense of a political ideal. He was willing to risk sitting in a cage for the next 40 or 50 years in order to combat this injustice. And I wanted to understand why that was. And what he ultimately told me, and it took a long time for me to, to understand it, he said that based on his view of himself and ethics and morality and his duties as a human being, that if he had to spend the rest of his life knowing that he had confronted this extreme injustice and had the opportunity to stand up to it, but chose not to because of fear, he said the pain of having to live with that knowledge, the pain of having that sit on his conscience, would be so much worse than anything the American government could do to him. And that was why he did it. Now, one of the things that I have thought about a lot over the past 18 months is that although that seemed remarkable to me at the time, it's actually fairly common. If you look at how injustice is confronted throughout history, not just in the United States, but almost in every part of the world, you'll find that it's essentially the Edward Snowdens, people who are ordinary, who have no particular power or position or prestige, who take it upon themselves to risk everything in order to fight the tyranny or the injustice that they see. It's people like Rosa Parks, the ordinary African-American woman who refused to sit at the back of the bus, or it's a street vendor in Tunisia who sets himself on fire and sparks an extraordinary revolution against the worst tyrannies in the Arab world, or it's kids like Sophie and Hans Scholl who, for whatever reason, risk their own lives knowingly in order to confront one of the worst injustices human history has ever known. And the thing that I've given a lot of thought to over the past 18 months is that we all have that in us. There's a reason why ordinary people are able and willing to take such extraordinary acts. It's just a matter of spending time thinking about what really matters in life, what it is that actually makes us happy, the value of having a clean conscience in knowing that you have done the right thing. And the reason I am so honored to receive this award in particular is because this is an award that is devoted to asking us to think about those very issues. And the more people think about those questions, the more Rosa Parks and Edward Snowden's and Sophie Scholl's there will be. That was probably the biggest lesson that I learned in doing this work. The lesson is that courage is contagious. You know, when, whenever I, I talk to Laura about the work that we ended up doing, we, we think back to that time in Hong Kong, which was so intense and, and entailed so many different decisions. And ultimately, I think what we realize now more than anything else is that we almost really didn't have any decision at all. When we saw this 29-year-old in total anonymity, willing to take the biggest risks you can take as a human being, we knew we had the obligation to do this work in the same spirit that animated him. 
and we knew we were going to be threatened with prosecution by the U.S. government. We knew there was a chance that we wouldn't be able to go back to the United States for a good long time, if ever. We knew that things would happen like having our internet communications surveilled and monitored and having the people closest to us, like my partner, detained and targeted. And we felt like we had no choice. The spirit of courage that Edward Snowden displayed infected us. And that, in turn, infected journalists at The Guardian and journalists at Der Spiegel and journalists all over the world who worked on these materials without any fear of any kind. And this, ultimately, to me, is the biggest lesson, which is, you know, I write about, I've been writing about politics for 10 years now. And it's very easy sometimes for people when they look at some kind of an injustice by a powerful government like the United States to tell themselves, well, there's nothing I really can do. I, I don't have enough power. I don't really have the ability to stand up to this. And I think the acts of people like Edward Snowden and Sophie and Han Scholl and so many other people prove how false that really is. The lesson of history is that any kind of injustice, any institution built by human beings can be confronted and resisted and torn down and destroyed by other human beings if the will and the moral courage is summoned. And that's a lesson that I think none of us should ever forget. So I'd just like to make one last point um, about the lesson that I think can be drawn from the incredible courage of the Scholl siblings. There, I think, is some kind of a resistance sometimes to drawing lessons for contemporary society from heroism or resistance of the Nazi era. There's a tendency to think, well, that is a singular evil and we shouldn't really make comparisons. And maybe there's some sense in which that's true. But the only way that those kinds of acts do have meaning is if we draw lessons from them. And I think there's also a sense that there's something maybe inappropriate about comparing resistance done in the face of a regime like Nazi Germany to resistance that is done in the context of Western democracies. And I have to say, I, I find that idea that there's an, something inappropriate about comparing those things to be really quite invalid. I think that it's really worth asking, first of all, to recognize that democracies are capable of all kinds of horrible acts. The regime that the Shoals confronted was a regime ushered in, in the first instance, through a democratic election. But I think it's worth asking, what do we mean when we talk about democracy? Is it simply that every three or four years, citizens are able to go into some box and press a button and pick the person that they want to have political power? I think democracy means a lot more than that. The people in Egypt were able three months ago to go and press a button for the person they wanted to have political power. People in Gaza were able to do that when they voted for Hamas. People in Afghanistan just did that when they elected a new government. I don't think any of us would say that those are really democracies. Democracy requires more than that. At the very least, at the very least, what democracy requires, if it's going to be more than just a symbol or a word, is that we as citizens know about what the most important acts are that the people in political power are doing. It has to be an informed choice in order for it to be meaningful. 
And one of the things that has happened in my country, the United States, but also its closest allies in, in the UK and, and Canada and Australia, and I think even to other EU states, is that the fear of terrorism has been exploited to justify an abandonment of those principles. What was most amazing to me in reading through these Snowden documents for the first time was not just how vast and comprehensive the spying was, the fact that there were billions of emails, billions of emails and telephone calls being collected and stored every single day. That wasn't even the most stunning part of it to me. What was more stunning was that my government and the British government and three other governments in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada that called themselves democracies had done all of this without any disclosure, any knowledge on the part of the citizens. Now you can have debates about what details should be kept secret, what technical terms should be concealed, but I can't imagine that there's anybody who would say that governments have the right to do something this significant to turn the internet into a realm of unprecedented monitoring and control and to do so without any democratic debate, any disclosure, any knowledge on the part of the citizens who are supposed to exercise informed consent. And the reason that Edward Snowden came forward and the reason that we decided to do the work that we did in such an aggressive manner was because we knew that this system was not just a threat to privacy, but a threat to democracy itself. And we wanted to do what I think journalism is supposed to be about, which is blowing a massive hole in the wall of secrecy behind which the world's most powerful governments are operating. And I am thrilled and excited, as I know as Edward Snowden, that the work we've done has created a global debate, not just about surveillance and privacy, but about secrecy and government abuse of power and the proper role of journalism. And it has caused human beings for the first time in the digital age to think about the power of the internet and what it can be if it is free and compare it to the weapon of oppression and control that it can become if it's not free. And I don't know the outcome of that debate. I don't know what the internet will become. But what I do know is that as a result of the work that we've been able to do over the past 18 months, that decision will be made by all of us in the open. And I can't imagine there's anybody who thinks it should be any other way. So with that, I, I thank you again very much for coming and, and thank you so much to uh, the, the prize award and the jury for giving me this prize. Thank you so much.